the embryonic sac will become noticeably darker. The parent fish now watch the development of the eggs very attentively. Sometimes they try to remove dead eggs from the nest. Unfortunately, by doing this, healthy eggs are often destroyed as well. Approximately 50 hours after fertilization, a very critical phase in the discus's care of the eggs begins. In the following five to 10 hours, up until the time of hatching, the eggs are often eaten by the parent fish for a variety of reasons. At this time, the advancing development of the embryo is clearly visible through the embryonic sac. The swelling of the head, the embryonic spine, and the yolk are already visible. The still unpigmented eye sockets are also visible. Between the head and the yolk, the small beating heart is already clearly visible. The embryonic germ layer has now fully covered the yolk and because of this also allows for the development of the body cavity. After approximately 55 hours, the embryo starts to become active in the embryonic sac and the first timid body movements are clearly visible. All of these movements signal developing life to the parent fish caring for the eggs. The absence of these signals indicates development has failed to occur. This shows an increasing number of eggs quickly becoming infected with fungus. In this case, the parents will eat the spawn at once. These are processes that usually remain hidden. To help the spawn survive this critical phase in their development without risk, Asian breeders protect the spawn with wire mesh. This prevents the parent fish from eating the spawn, but allows them to care for the eggs nevertheless. Usually only a few hours later, the wiggling larvae will not be eaten by the parents who will continue to care for them. After about 60 hours, existence in the embryonic sac will become too cramped for the embryo. Its vigorous movements inside the embryonic sac can be seen in ever decreasing intervals. With this movement, it manages to turn itself around inside the embryonic sac with spirited flaps of its tail. This tail flapping quickly lacerates the embryonic sac and results in direct contact with its new environment, the water. But the exertion is not over. After the developmental period of approximately 50 to 60 hours and the breaking of the embryonic sac, it takes another one to two hours to kick the torn sac over its body and head and free itself from it to finally make the transition from an embryo to a discus larva. But an important contrivance of nature keeps the embryonic sac attached to the larva for a while longer. The adhesive glands on the head of the larva, which begin to function at this time and will later keep it attached to the substratum, holding the remaining embryonic sac in place with its adhesive substance. This exhausting fight into life is shortened by the parent fish who watch these developments carefully, collect the larvae out of the embryonic sac, take them into their mouths, and then hang them onto the substratum by their adhesive mucus for further development, unfettered by all remnants of the embryonic sac. According to Professor Dr. Heinz Bremer, this first contact with the mucus of the parent fish has a disinfecting, bacteria-reducing effect. This step ends another phase of development. The growth of the larvae now continues to progress, depending on the quality of the water. After another 12 hours, the crypt for the eyes will darken, and the formation of the eyes can be observed. The head and anal areas, as well as the embryonic tail, shows signs of continuing development. The cardiac utricle, located directly under the head, pumps blood through the entire small larval body with all of its might. Even at this point in time, the larvae could die off if water conditions are bad. Eggs that have already died and have not been removed by the parent fish will now begin to slowly disintegrate. Protozoan hasten this process. 
Sometimes the embryonic sac will also break open and dead yolk will run out. The empty egg membrane remains, but later it will also be decomposed by bacteria and protozoan. Also at this time, the fungus infection of the dead eggs is clearly visible. The healthy larvae continue to develop. About four days after fertilization, the development of the eyes can be clearly seen. The outlines of the gills and the mouth are also visible. The small heart pumps the blood unremittingly through the body. The forming anal opening as well as the tail of the discus fish larvae are also easily recognizable now. The blood vessels on the still visible yolk can clearly be seen. Parent fish will often move the larvae. Also, the small discus are constantly becoming more active. Because of this activity, the adhesive mucus, which is produced by the larvae, is often put to the test. Six glands produce this mucus. It's mainly secreted from the upper glands in the form of mycelium and holds the larvae in place on the substratum. They hang on the substratum singly or in groups. With intensive wiggling, they create the water movement necessary for their oxygen supply. Approximately five days after fertilization and at a water temperature of 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, the development of the larvae is already amazingly advanced. The iris of the eyes is already starting to show pigmentation. The head and parts of the body are starting to show more and more dark patches and lines. The mouth and the gills stand out clearly and their movement can be seen. The heart is beating strongly now. The embryonic spine, otherwise called the vertebral column, and the tail shows marked signs of the back and lower borders of the fins. However, the dorsal fin is not yet formed. At this stage of their development, the larvae can hardly hold themselves onto the substratum due to their increasingly vigorous movements. But even at this point in time, a badly stabilized water environment can result in deformities or the death of the larvae. For example, deformities of the abdominal cavity, the heart, and the vertebral column. Usually deformed larvae will be eaten by the parent fish or will perish at the bottom of the aquarium. The development of the larvae is usually completed after about six days. The head and the eyes, the mouth and the gills are completely developed and fully functional. The yolk is used up. Now the larva is nearly five millimeters long. The front glands cease to function and atrophy in the next few days. With this step, the passive larval stage comes to an end and the spawn begins to swim. It can take a period of several hours until all of the offspring are able to swim. The swimming larvae will now need their first food. This is offered to them in the form of the epidermis, the upper skin layer of the parent fish, which has heavily thickened. It is their only possible food source in these first few days of life. Its existence is apparently a crucial requirement for the further development of the larvae. Usually this is referred to as the mucus that the parent fish produce on their epidermis, or rather on the upper layer of their skin. This so-called mucus is then eaten by the larvae. But is it correct to refer to this substance as mucus? And what does this important food consist of? We asked Professor Dr. Heinz Bremer. The feeding of offspring 
after their birth with substances of the parent animals is an incredible evolutional development in the animal kingdom. It gives the animals more freedom because they are independent of the food supply in the environment they are born into. This perfect solution, like the one reached by mammals, naturally had its precursors. I would say they are the experiments of nature on the way to becoming mammals. With mammals, it is all very perfect. There are epithelium, or rather skin cells, that have transformed themselves into glandular cells that are shifted toward the inside and produce the milk by way of apocrine secretion, which means by way of the cells. Let's assume that this is the nucleus and here is where the milk is produced and it is stored in the uppermost part of the cell. And this entire part of the cell cuts itself off and is severed and the milk is ultimately composed of millions of such cells and the apocrine content. One of the precursors to the actual mammal milk is the milk of the pigeon. In this case, the cement substance between the cells is merely dissolved and that with which the young animals are fed in the first few days is a suspension of cells. So it is not a secretion like real milk but rather the entire cell material in suspension. With the discus, the entire upper layer is provided for the young fish as postnatal food, without the cells detaching themselves in any special way. This upper portion, or the epidermis, is enriched with nutrient cells, with glandular cells. On this occasion, I would particularly like to point out that it is not mucus that the parent fish secrete or discharge and provide for the young fish, but rather the entire upper layer of the epidermis enriched with nutrient cells. This upper layer of the epidermis that I have just described contains only carbohydrates, fat and protein in small concentrations and in a balanced mixture. It is optimally suited for the digestive system of the still unstable young fish. In addition, the trophically functioning epidermis, the epidermis able to provide nourishment, contains immunologically effective components. This means that it strengthens the immune system of the young fish. And finally, I would like to point out that bacteria and algae can be found in the intestines of the larvae that were previously located on the epidermis of the parent fish and are ingested while grazing the epidermis. Therefore, the basis for exogenous feeding for the larvae is provided. This immediately follows the phase of being fed via the parent fish. To sum it up, I'll say once again that the discus parents provide their larvae with an intragenous substance containing carbohydrates, fat and protein in small concentrations. And secondly, this substance supports